satellite that's going around Saturn. This is the edge of Saturn. This is the ring of Saturn. And that's one of the moons of Saturn. <laughs> you know, once I saw that picture, I realized I could never do anything with a telescope like that, you know, here on Earth. And I sort of, anyway, uh, I, I just find that to be an amazing thing. Okay, so t today I'm going to try to talk about two different things. One is about solar cells, which is what it's, what's been advertised. But I also want to talk a little bit about, and, and I, I sort of would like to uh, give you a flavor for how solar cells operate and what the status of that form of energy generation is. And then uh, I also want to talk about an, another field which is kind of the complement of solar cells. Solar cells uh, detect light and create electrical signals, right, and electrical power. Uh, the opposite of that is a device that takes electrical signals and creates light, or an LED. And the reason that I want to talk about that is that many of the issues that you uh, confront in trying to make a Good technology are about the same. Uh, that is cost and, and uh, efficiency of the devices. But um, also, there's just some really cool devices I have I want to show you. So, <laughs> um, so and, and in addition to that, here at USC, we, we just received a major grant from oh, the right. Department of Energy to work on both of those. Um, technologies. Solar energy for the generation of electrical power and also uh, what we refer to as solid state lighting. And this is a concept where we hope that we can replace uh, these uh, more uh, inefficient sources of light like uh, incandescent bulbs, you know, the standard light bulb, and even fluorescent bulbs which are much more efficient than incandescent bulbs with solid state light sources that have the advantage that they won't burn out, last for a long time, and they're about twice as efficient as these devices. Now, you've already seen that happening uh, in your everyday life. You drive around the streets and you see stoplights that have these new red LEDs and tail lights on cars. In addition to that, uh, Headlights on cars are going to be uh, moving towards LEDs. So, it, it, and the reason that it's important in the context of energy is that uh, there's an enormous amount of energy used to generate light. And if we can do it more efficiently, then we save energy and we don't have to burn as much fossil fuel or create as many solar cells. Okay, so uh, let me get started. And just briefly remind you of something that you may already be aware of. And that is that the sun is actually probably the primary source of energy here on Earth. Okay. So, you know, we normal, normally think of things like fossil fuels, coal, gas, oil, that we burn uh, to create heat and energy as uh, sort of resources that we dig out of the earth. But in reality, uh, those fossil fuels were at one time plant material that was created by photosynthesis here on earth where the sunshine on the earth caused plants to grow. And so they're a form of stored solar energy. Okay. Unfortunately, they're a form that is uh, a legacy of many years in the past. They're not renewable. And, um, and as a result of that, when we burn them uh, to create heat and energy uh, and release carbon dioxide, we're releasing uh, gases that were trapped on the Earth uh, millions and billions of years ago. Uh, and uh, that, as you know, is uh, beginning to worry 
many people, including myself, in terms of our climate in the future. So, um, in addition to fossil fuels, there's also other sources of solar energy, hydroelectric power. Motion of water is caused by the uh, evaporation of water on Earth, the, the uh, rain that deposits the water in various places, then the water then flows, and we capture that energy from the motion of the water in dams to create uh, electrical power. But in reality, the energy that that water uh, has is acquired by absorbing heat from the sun. Okay, so it's a form of solar energy. S similarly with wind energy. Okay. And of course, the things that we normally think about as solar energy are photovoltaics or solar cells. And then there's also solar thermal energy. And, and uh, I'm going to focus essentially all of the talk today just on solar cells or what we call solar photovoltaic energy. And of course, there is a, a new area of, of investigation to create renewable energy, and that is to take carbon dioxide that's currently in the atmosphere, grow plants with it, and then burn those plants or create um, things like gas or ethanol from the plants. Uh, to burn. That's a renewable form of energy because we're taking carbon dioxide that currently is in the atmosphere, creating plant material, and then burning it. So we're recycling this thing. So we're not generating any new carbon dioxide by doing that. Unfortunately, right now, this is a very expensive way of making energy. And, uh, uh, people are working really hard to try to uh, uh, reduce the cost. Okay, now I have two other ones that are uh, in black in here that um, are not forms of solar energy, and they're also not uh, renewable energy. One is uh, nuclear energy, where you take the radioactive materials that are buried deep within the earth, take them and create nuclear reactors that uh, uh, generate electrical power. Similarly, there's thermal, geothermal energy. You take the heat that is uh, generated deep within the Earth, partially by nuclear reactions in the core of the Earth, and we convert that heat into electrical energy uh, using geothermal energies. So, you know, there may be other, there's, there's uh, wave power and tidal power and things like that that people are working on, which are also forms of solar energy. But, uh, this, this is a, a pretty good list, and, and by far right now, we're, we're acquiring most of our energy by burning uh, fossil fuels. So there's a, a, a very strong movement uh, by the current government and, and by scientists in general to move away from these fuels towards uh, these renewable forms of energy, or energy that at least comes from the sun, even if it's not Okay, so what, first of all, I, you know, I have to apologize in advance. I had a whole group of slides put together that I had just assembled in the last couple of days. And uh, as I was preparing this uh, presentation about an hour ago, I inadvertently dumped, dumped the whole file. So I had to try to recreate it in the last hour. And get it all done, so I apologize for that. But how many of you are aware of what the source of energy is from the sun? Well, I've got it written here, of course. Um, the sun is a nuclear reactor. Okay? It's a fusion reactor. The sun is a very um, large, uh, you know, many uh, thousands of times larger than the Earth, a ball of gases. And the mutual gravity or the attraction of those atoms creates so much pressure and density at the center of the sun that the atoms that are there, which are primarily hydrogen, actually 
uh, bang into one another hard enough that they fuse and create helium in so doing. And when they do that, they release some energy. And that's a, what's called a, a fusion reaction. And that is going on in the core of the sun. The temperatures there are uh, many thousands of millions of degrees temperature, extremely high temperatures. By the time you reach the surface of the sun, the surface looks like it has a temperature of about 5,800 degrees Kelvin. Kelvin is related to degrees centigrade. Um, uh, it's uh, about 5,500 degrees centigrade. And that's pretty hot. Water, water is 100 degrees centigrade, so 58 times uh, outer temperature, 55 degrees. <laughs> and so this is the uh, source of uh, all the energy that uh, we receive from the sun by these reactions that cause heat. The heat causes the sun to glow like something that we refer to as a black body. Now, anything that is um, heated, you might notice, um, you know, when it's at, at low temperatures, it's whatever color it might be. Uh, but if you heat it up to higher and higher temperatures, it begins to glow, first a dull red, and then eventually it'll glow almost a, a bright yellow. Okay. Very similarly, the sun is glowing like a, a heated body which is heated from the nuclear reactions at the core. And uh, the energy that it radiates is in the form of electromagnetic radiation or light. Mm. Okay. And we uh, are the recipients of that as well as uh, all of the other planets by the fraction of the light that uh, is emitted by the sun that impinges on the Earth. So, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the nature of this light and then uh, we'll talk about how we use it to create electrical power in, in a solar system. So, first thing to, to um, recognize is that light is the, the light that we are sensitive to, that we see uh, when we uh, turn on lights in the room or we'll walk out in the sun um, is only a fraction of the total uh, spectrum of possible forms of electromagnetic energy. Okay. And, uh, and it's the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we call the visible part of the spectrum okay, because we can see it. Our eyes are sensitive to it. Uh, and the light uh, is characterized by two parameters that I want to uh, introduce very early on. One is the so-called frequency of the light, and the other is the so-called wavelength of the light. And I'm going to, I have to introduce these ideas because I'm going to be talking about them uh, time and time again when we talk about solar stuff. So if we view uh, an electro electromagnetic field as something which is oscillating, where the electric field is oscillating in time and in space, uh, which is shown here schematically, then the frequency is how fast this, if we were to sit right here at this position and measure how, uh, the amplitude of the electric field at some particular time, it would be how fast that is oscillating up and down with time. The wavelength is related to spatially how, how big a distance it takes for us to measure one full cycle of this uh, electromagnetic radiation. So those are two characteristics of light, and it turns out they're related to one another. They're related to one another by the fact that the product of the frequency and the wavelength is the speed of light. The speed of light is a constant, 3 times 10 to the 8 uh, meters, per centimeter, meters per second, centimeters per second. 
So that's a basic idea that um, is, is sometimes difficult to reconcile with uh, the classical picture that was developed in the 1800s of what, uh, of what light and electromagnetic waves are. But it was essential in order to be able to describe the phenomena that people were observing for the first time in the uh, early 1900s. So most sources of light are made up of many photons of different frequencies. So for example, when we look at uh, white light that uh, emanates from a source of light like the fluorescent tube, if we were to measure the frequency of the light, uh, of all of the light in the, uh, in the source of light, what we find out is that there are many different frequencies represented. And therefore, the light beam is formed from many photons that have different frequencies. Okay. And the distribution of the photons, that is the number that are, uh, occur at each of the frequencies, is referred to as the spectrum of the light source. Okay. And the final fact that I want to make, uh, make you aware of is that the optical power, how, how much energy per unit time we measure from a light source, is the number of photons that are coming per second times the energy of the photon. So, those are just some basic facts that deal with the basic uh, nature of light uh, that is relevant to uh, making a solar cell. Okay, so if we were to look at the spectrum of stars, um, of various types, the sun being one, what we would find is that if we measured the intensity of the light at different wavelengths, okay, and there are a variety of uh, techniques for doing that, we find that there is a spectrum of light as a function of the wavelength that uh, looks somewhat like this for the sun. This is a kind of a schematic picture. And that is the, a very similar spectrum to what we would observe if we were able to create 
some hot body that was heated to 5,800 degree, 5, degrees Kelvin. And so that's why we say that the sun has a characteristic temperature of 5,800 degrees Kelvin. Okay? And any, any body that was heated to that temperature would have a very similar spectrum. Now, if we look at other stars that are in the uh, that are easily observable in the universe, we find that they have different spectra, and that has to do with the fact that different stars have uh, uh, different some amounts of nuclear uh, uh, processes going on. And so, for example, there's one star spike that, which has a uh, characteristic temperature of 23,000 degrees Kelvin. And as a result, because of the higher temperature, the wavelength of the light is, is smaller, of the peak light. Uh, and it turns out in this particular case, the spectrum is also narrower. It has fewer photons per unit, but relatively speaking, more of the photons are concentrated here in the shorter wavelength regions. Uh, Similarly, Antares, which is an, another uh, star that's uh, visible in the universe, has a lower temperature, and it's shifted to longer wavelength. And that's a characteristic of black bodies. Uh, the higher the temperature of the black body source, the shorter will be the wavelength of the peak light, and low, uh, by the same token, the uh, lower the temperature will be, the, the longer will be the now, why is this important? It's important because what we have here is a, a group or, or an ensemble of photons that are coming at us uh, per unit time that are spread over a wide range of wavelengths or over a wide range of energies. And what we're going to see is that if we want to try to convert that to electricity, there's one of two things we can do. We can just use that energy and heat something up by absorbing the light on a black surface or something, uh, something similar to that. And that's one way that people generate energy from the sun. There are plants being installed in the desert right now that just absorb this light to create heat. And that heat then heats up some fluid, creates a boiler, and we uh, run a turbine and generate electrical energy. Okay. However, the kind of device that I'm going to talk about uses the specific energy of the photons to create electrical energy and uh, direct. And uh, so the energies of these photons that are contained in the solar spectrum are important. Now, this is a different plot of, and, and a more scientifically correct plot of the solar spectrum, and it's plotted in a different way. So the other one was plotted as a function of wavelength, and this is, and, and wavelength is up here at the, uh, on the upper scale. So short wavelength is over here, long wavelength is over here, but it's plotted on, down here as a function of energy. And this is not a linear plot anymore but it's a logarithmic plot. So this represents, each one of these major divisions here represents a factor of 10 in terms of the amount, number of photons that are present at that particular wavelength. The thing I want to do to uh, show by illustrating this thing, and if you suspend for a minute your um, uh, trying to figure out why the spectrum looks different, and just recognize that this is the spectrum, uh, I've shown two different of the spectrum. It runs one more, right? from about one more? Uh, three on this scale to about mm, 1.7 or so on this scale. So from about 0.8 microns to about 0.4 microns. And that is the visible region of the spectrum. Oh, okay, I've got it denoted. Over, over here is the so-called ultraviolet region of the spectrum. This part of the spectrum is absorbed by 
ozone that's up in the top layers of the atmosphere. And um, it's uh, this region of the spectrum which we're seeing some changes in over the last uh, couple of decades because of depletion of the ozone layer. And we're getting more and more ultraviolet light compared to what this curve uh, might suggest. Ultraviolet light, incidentally, is what causes sunburn. It's what causes skin cancer. It, it is very high energy photons that go in and they damage the skin. Okay. So, are the UV lights usually what you want? Well, okay, that's a good question. And they certainly have the most energy, but you'll notice that there are many fewer of them okay, than there are, is in the visible part of the spectrum. And we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to show you that every photon that you absorb creates one electrical charge that you can use to, uh, for electrical current. So it's not only the energy of the photon that's important. In fact, that's of, almost of secondary importance compared to the number of photons that are present. Yes. Um, so the ultraviolet light from the skin. No, it doesn't. It actually doesn't penetrate very far. It, it actually gets absorbed by the cells um, near the surface of the skin. And what's, what's damaging about ultraviolet light is that it creates chemical changes in the skin. And that's what leads, well, that's what leads to sunburn, for one thing, but it's also what leads to cancer, potentially, because it, it, it damages the DNA, essentially, of the uh, cells. You had a question, or you just wanted to know? Oh, I had a question. Sorry, um, this question um, involves your uh, first slide regarding the uh, Fusion and the yeah, sun. yeah. I was just wondering, like, since we need like sunlight temperatures to do the fusion, then does that mean that by the time we've been able to fusion, that we we've already been able to create our own sun? You mean if we if we we're able to harness fusion to as an energy source? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Then. What? Our own sun. Yeah. In, <laughs> essentially, what they do on a try to do on a very small scale almost a microscopic scale, is to create the density of atoms and the temperature of the atoms so that the atoms will fuse together. But instead of, you know, the sun is this huge body where uh, the scale at which this is occurring is enormous, they're trying to do it on a micros almost a microscopic scale compared to that. So you get energy from it, but you know it's something that runs away. Now, they haven't been able to do that successfully yet. I mean, they've, they've fused atoms, but they haven't been able to do it in such a way that they get some net energy back from the process. No, it takes more energy to force the atoms together and to cause them to fuse than you get back from their reaction. Okay. You'll notice over here in the region of the spectrum which is called infrared. Now infrared radiation is longer wavelength radiation. We don't see it. Our eyes are not sensitive to it. Uh, we can feel infrared radiation and it creates warmth in our skin, but it doesn't damage the skin. It just is the kind of warmth that you feel from a fire if you're not really, uh, say, if air isn't blowing from a fire towards you. You just feel a warmth. That's the infrared radiation. And you'll notice that there's a lot of dips in that spectrum where some of the photons are miss, missing. And the reason for that is that there's water vapor in the atmosphere. And water vapor absorbs at certain specific wavelengths or energies. And those dips are due to the fact that the, the, that part of the spectrum from the sun is being absorbed in the upper atmosphere. Now, CO2 also absorbs in, in the infrared region. And if there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, it gets absorbed and it creates heating in the atmosphere. And that's part of the source of this global warming that scientists are concerned about. So the more CO2 there is, the more absorption. Um, 
anyway, uh, I've already talked about the solar spectrum. Now, uh, this transition here is missing a few slides that I wasn't able to recreate, so I'll have to do it with a little bit of discussion. Um, if we want to create a solar cell, what we have to do is somehow take these photons that are coming from the sun and in a material of some sort generate electrical um, currents from those photons. And I'm going to anticipate uh, something I'm going to tell you in just a minute. That every photon that gets absorbed in a material creates one electron. So the more photons that you have impinging on the material and absorbed by the material, the more electrical current that you can generate from the, from the solar source. It's viewed in that sense as something what we call a quantum detector. It takes one quantum of electromagnetic energy and it creates one electron. So it's very quantum. Okay? It's not like, uh, you know, you, uh, the case of uh, thermal, solar thermal, where you heat something up and you just absorb them and you generate uh, uh, a lot of heat that somehow then you convert into electrical energy. The process here is one for one. One photon generates one electron, which then can flow in an electrical circuit and uh, generate electrical power. So, um, there's a variety of different material. There are a variety of different materials that are currently being employed to make solar cells, and they fall into three different uh, categories. Uh, they're all what we call solid state materials. If you had held them in your hand, they would be solid. They would, if you tried to flex them, they would break. They're, they're uh, fracture, fracturable, and, and, and they're not like uh, silly putty or anything like that that you could stretch. They're very hard and solid. Okay, and the materials that are uh, used uh, fall into three different categories. One is called crystalline materials, one's called polycrystalline, and one's called amorphous. And what I tried to show schematically here is, I'm sorry, you could name the way, um, is how the atoms in these solids sort of arrange themselves in order to for a given classification. So let me start with the most ordered of them, which is a crystalline material. In these kind of materials, every atom has a specific arrangement with respect to the atom next to it. And if you look in one position and in another position, you will find exactly the same arrangement of the atoms before you're able to, to look at them. So there's a, a very ordered structure that extends throughout the entire piece of material. So if I start right here, I can go over n number of, uh, say, an integer number of spacings between the atoms in this direction and find myself in, a, in an environment where it looks exactly the same as I have over here. So that's the most ordered and the most expensive of materials. There's all, and, and these are the kind of materials that integrated circuits, for example, are made from. They're made from crystalline solids, namely silicon, silicon uh, crystalline silicon. But another form of crystalline solid is a diamond that, you know, uh, rubies and things like that. There are all kinds of crystals that you can uh, that are uh, have uh, uh, an ordered structure like this. On the other end is something called amorphous material, where the atoms have no relationship to one another. They're just sort of all stuck together. There is some maybe very local arrangement of atoms, but if you move uh, many atom spacings away you find that the environment is entirely different. And then intermediate between those two is something called polycrystalline material, where in small regions, uh, on the order of, say, 10 to minus 6 meters or thereabouts, 
you might find a crystalline region and adjacent to that another crystalline region, but they're not um, ordered with respect to one another. Okay. So why do I talk about this? Well, I talk about this because in a crystalline solid, the properties of the materials are very well behaved, and the very best solar cells are made from those kind of materials. On the other hand, as we go towards less ordered material, you can also make solar cells from them, but in general, oh, and, and, and in so doing, the cost is usually greatly reduced. And that's one of the big issues in solar energy is, is getting down the cost of, of this material. Okay. And so uh, there's a tendency, for example, to try to build solar cells from either polycrystalline or uh, um, amorphous materials in very thin films that are just deposited on a piece of glass, for example. And uh, uh, a great deal of progress is being made, and, and these kind of solar cells are being sold. But the highest performance cells are made from crystalline material. Now, uh, this is a, a, probably more detailed than you, you care to know, but uh, if you looked at a material like diamond, or a material like uh, silicon, uh, as, which is used in integrated circuits, you'd find that there's a very specific arrangement of the atoms with respect to one another. There's a basic building block that is made up of five atoms. You have a central atom here bonded to four other atoms that are equally distributed in spatial angle with respect to one another. And the reason that this arrangement takes place is that there is a bond a chemical bond between these atoms that is made up of the electrons that orbit around the nucleus of the, uh, of the atom. And so you get an arrangement where you have very specific orientational and distance arrangements between the atoms. So uh, this is the kind of crystalline form that silicon and many other semiconductors that are used for uh, solar cells are uh, uh, crystallizing. And, and in fact, diamond, as I mentioned, also is in this form. In fact, this is called the diamond structure. And in that particular case, these would be carbon atoms, whereas in the case of silicon, of course, these are silicon. There's another material called germanium, which is another position in the periodic table, where these atoms then but all bonded in the same sort of way, or the same geometrical arrangement. Now, I'm going to show you this picture because I want to come back to it later on to describe what absorption of light in one of these materials actually does. Okay. And what I've done here is I've tried to represent this arrangement of four atoms surrounding one atom in a two-dimensional Uh, approximation. So if this is a one atom of my solid material, then the nearest atoms to it are these four right here. And they are all arranged in such a way that two electrons exist between the two atoms. And these two electrons come one from each of the two atoms involved in that particular bond. And so this is a very directional bond between these two atoms, between these two atoms. And there's no particular bond that exists between these atoms. Okay? So when we have a solid that uh, exists at, you know, uh, under normal conditions with no light shining on them, all of those bonding positions have an electron in them. And this material, uh, it, you know, is what we call unexcited at that particular time. Now, when we absorb light, the photon comes in and basically take the energy of that photon, ex uh, knocks one of these electrons out of the bonding position and uh, 
sends it free to roam through and among the various atoms of the solid. So this absorption process results in the exchange of the energy of the photon to the energy of this electron. Now you might say, well, okay, if it drops all of its energy, then the higher the energy of the photon, the faster the electron would move away because it's got more energy. And to some extent that's true, but one of the things that you, uh, that you need to recognize that is that it takes a certain amount of energy even to knock one of these electrons away from that, that bonding position. And that energy is shown here in a diagram, uh, which I didn't get a chance to label. I plotted here energy vertically and, say, position uh, laterally. So the photon comes along and it takes one of these electrons and knocks it up to higher energy. But it has to have enough energy to excite it from this energy level up to this energy level because there are no possible energies, energy states in this solid in between this energy and this energy. And that absence of any possible states is called the energy gap. It's a characteristic of the material and no photons whose energy are lower than that energy gap will be absorbed. So if I came in with a lower energy photon, which I would indicate with a redder color or something like that, it would go right through the material and wouldn't knock any of the electrons out of the, uh, out of the bonding position. Once that photon knocks an electron up here, it disappears. It's absorbed. Its energy is converted into the energy of this electron up here in the uh, higher energy states of the cell. Now it turns out that there's not just one energy level here and one energy level here. There's a whole group of energy levels up here and a whole group here. So if I came in with a photon that had higher energy, I might be able to knock an, uh, an, energy, uh, an electron from here way up to here. But eventually, that electron would fall right back down to, the, to this uh, minimum energy state as it moves through the uh, crystal. And it would lose that energy by basically creating a little bit of heat in the solid. So this energy gap has two, fo two characteristics, or, or it lends two characteristics to the material. First of all, no photons with energy lower than the energy gap are absorbed. And all photons whose energy are greater than the energy gap are absorbed, but they generally create electrons whose energies are now back here at the uh, minimum energy in this upper uh, group of energy states. Now, if I just left the system alone, what would happen is that this electron would roam through the solid until it found an empty spot somewhere else in the bonding, in, in a bond. And it would lose its energy by falling down into that empty state. We call that annihilation of electron hole. And in certain materials, that might result in the regeneration of the photon. And so there would be a photon created whose energy was equal to the difference in energy between this electron and this empty state now, which we, in the business, is called a hole because it's an empty state. So, uh, solar cells work by absorbing light and creating electrons. Light emitting diodes work by creating electrons with electrical current and then having them fall down into empty states and generate photons. So they're the, they're the inverse of one another in some respects. Yes? Is that the positron? I'm sorry? Is that the positron? No, no. A positron is uh, is a high energy particle or a high energy pair of particles. Well, this you mean this thing? No. A positron is a uh, no. <laughs> uh, it gets into nuclear physics, and I, I just am, uh, not try to get off there. But that's really a separate kind of fundamental particle. This. 
that this entity here is just a site in the lattice where one of these electrons is missing. Okay? So this whole system would be neutral if all of the electrons were in their bonding sites. And when one electron is knocked out, that particular location is positively charged because the electron is negatively charged. But, and, and in fact, an electron from over here could jump into this empty place, which has the effect of that empty place moving over to here. So in semiconductor science, we think about these holes actually moving through the, uh, through the crystal also. And we focus not so much on all of the electrons, but we focus on the empty states here and the electrons which are not in bonding states. Worry about what they're doing and don't worry about all the rest of them. But it's not a positive one, that's a, that's a separate fundamental particle, nuclear particle. Okay, so, huh. I'm going to skip that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's a lot, I, this was a last minute, grab something from a class and pump it in there because I wanted to talk about some of the things. There's a lot of materials that are mm -hmm. suitable for solar cells that have energy gaps in a you know, reasonable region of the spectrum that will you know, absorb the light of the right colors or the right frequencies. Uh, and this just discusses them, and I don't want to talk about them. Um, let me just say that when you start thinking about how to build a solar cell and uh, how do you build a low-cost solar cell, most of those materials are impractical. And only a few have survived in an important And the chief of them is silicon, which is also the material used for uh, integrated circuits. Now, when, when we build integrated circuits, uh, we want large pieces of material that are all single crystal. And the way that that's done is that you take a molten pot of silicon and you take a really tiny piece of material that's all single crystal and you dip it in there and then begin to slowly extract it from that molten pot. And when you do, some of the material that's in the pot begins to solidify on the piece that you're extracting. And what happens is that if you do things right, the size of the, uh, the uh, crystal begins to increase. So we call this growing crystal. And you can see here that the tiny, uh, well, actually, the, this is the part they dipped in. And then they did something which we call necking down. And they pulled it out at a fast rate until uh, at some point then they begin to slow down. And then they start to form a large crystal and that just keep, continues to grow in size until they exhaust all of the melted material here. And so in the end, these things now are like 12 inches in diameter, that's a foot, and they're a meter long. That's a material in which every atom in that piece of material is arranged in a precise location with respect to every other atom. It's really a phenomenal uh, technological accomplishment. It turns out that the uh, plan right now for silicon integrated circuit is, is to increase the size of this from 12 inches up to 18 inches. And these things are pretty heavy. It's 140 kilograms, you know, several hundred pounds. And huge uh, chunk of single crystal material. And then what's done is that, uh, well, it, it isn't shown so well by this, this picture. But there's a saw that's used to cut thin slices out of that, out of that loaf of silicon bread, if you will, until you create these round wafers. And those are what are used to make integrated circuits, but also solar cells on the surface of these wafers of material. Now, it turns out that uh, for solar cells, uh, 
it's not so crucial that it all be single crystal, and so other techniques are used for making the, the wafers, but uh, also very large size uh, wafers can be made uh, by the techniques that are used there. So, now, let's talk a, a little bit about the characteristics of a, of a solar cell detector. Um, I already talked about the fact that uh, in, a, in, a, in one of these detectors, there are the energy of the electrons that are in the quiescent state lie at lower energy, and the photon knocks the electron up to a high energy state. It's a one-for-one -one process. So no photons are absorbed until the photon energy is high enough to, to uh, accomplish this uh, feat. And then once it does, um, the, the rate at which the absorption occurs as a function of energy is pretty much uh, relatively slowly dependent on, on the energy. But no photons are absorbed below the energy gap and then all of the photons above the energy gap are absorbed. So that's an important thing to remember. Okay. Now, in, in a solar cell, it's important to not only create the electron and the hole, for, uh, but it's also important to get that electron into an external wire so that it can do work by uh, causing a, a motor to turn or a light to light or however you want to use it. And there's a structure that has uh, been developed. It was one of the early uh, ideas of semiconductor science. And that is to create a so-called PN junction. And I don't have time today to go into how this is done, but suffice it to say it's possible to create a region of material where there is an excess of holes in the material and another region of material where there's an excess of electrons. And when you put these two materials together, it turns out that uh, the, the two uh, regions of material adjust their energies so that they're at a slightly different energy. And as a result, when we create an electron, if it can move to the interface between the P region and the N region, it will then flow into this material where, it, where there are very few holes and many electrons, and it's then available to move into the external circuit. Similarly, this positively charged hole can move from the P side, or from this N side, over into the P side where there's a predominance of holes. And then it can also escape the device as current. Now, it seems a little strange, you might admit, to talk about the absence of an electron as an entity. In reality, what's happening is that this empty position is actually being filled by an electron here that jumps over to here. In doing that, this hole moves over to here. So we're keeping track of the, moment, the position of that empty spot, not all of the electrons that, that move in. It's like watching a bubble in water. If you put a bubble on the top of a bottle, you turn it over, what appears to happen? The bubble appears to rise in the bottom, right? What's really happening? The water is flowing down and filling the empty space at the top. Okay? Same idea. Only we're talking about electrons and holes. Is my time already up? It's it's getting there, but <laughs> okay. So, if you look at one of these uh, solar cells, it absorbs light and creates current. If that current flows through some uh, source that are, or some what we call a load that can generate some power by using the current to cause motion of a motor or to heat up uh, something or to light a light or whatever, then the process of generating this electrical current and passing it through this load is a way of generating power in the 
electrical power. Okay? And the characteristics of the solar cell look like this if we plot the current as a function of the voltage across the solar cell, we find that it has this kind of characteristic. And the, the point at which you can generate the maximum power is the point where the product of the current and the voltage is the maximum, which turns out to be schematically right about here. So if we can arrange our loads so that this thing operates right at this point, we get the maximum efficiency out of the device. And the power that, or the efficiency of the device then, is the electrical power generated, the product of the current times the voltage, divided by the amount of solar energy power that's necessary to create that amount of current. Okay? And currently, current, um, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, okay, so you might ask then, well, what is the best you can ever do with the solar stuff? And this gets back to the question that someone in the front row here asked about whether I, whether I would want to use uh, UV photons mostly, or whether I want to use... And the point is that you want to use as, want to absorb as many photons as you can, so long as the voltage of your, uh, the output voltage of your device, which is related to the band gap of the material, or the energy gap rather, doesn't get too small. And so if you calculate, you know, what is the total amount of current you could generate from a given material times what is the expected voltage that you might get out of a device made from that material, it turns out that there's a curve that plots the maximum efficiency that you could expect as a function of the energy gap of the material. And it turns out it peaks up right here at about 1.4 to 1.5 electrons. That corresponds to. So should I switch uh, it to long? You're not, so that probably not well calibrated in that energy measure. Uh, it's a very small yeah, energy, after. but uh, anyway, um, it corresponds to a material that would emit light at about 8,000 angstrom. So yeah. gallium arsenide, silicon are very close to the maximum that you would expect to see. And that's why a lot of the focus is on these two materials for solar cells. It turns out there are others that also uh, fall into that category. But the maximum efficiency that you would expect to see is about 30 to 40%, or 30 to 35%, which isn't all that great. That means that 60% of the solar energy incident is being Waste. And that's the optimum. Okay. So, uh, and and th this is fundamental. It, it it is something that cannot be uh, fudged with by uh, uh, doing um, you know some trick to the material. If you're dealing with a single solar cell, that's the maximum efficiency that you can expect to get. And it has to do with the trade-off between making the band gap large enough that you get a good voltage out of the device compared to making the band gap small and absorbing more photons. Okay? And so uh, the optimal point turns out to be at an energy gap right about there at 30-some at 30, uh, 30 percent. And, and so uh, where, do, where do things stand right now? Well, in real practice, silicon solar cells are made which have efficiencies of 23 to 26%. And gallium arsenide solar cells are made which have efficiencies close to 30%. Okay. So they're very close to being the optimum that you can achieve. Still not good enough. So, people who work in this area thought about new ways of creating higher efficiency solar cells. And this gets to the idea that, okay, if I absorbed blue photons with a material that had an energy gap that was close to the threshold that, that blue photons could absorb, I would collect all of the blue photons and shorter wavelength photons, and I would convert them at a high voltage. 
if I took the photons that were in the green region of the spectrum and converted them with an energy gap that was appropriate for green, then I would get a higher voltage and I would convert all of those photons at a higher voltage than I would if I let those green photons be absorbed by a small band gap. So the idea here is to separate the spectrum into different bands and to absorb them in different solar cells so that you get the maximum efficiency from the, free, from the photons in that particular energy band. Okay. And there's two ways of doing that. You could use optics to split the spectrum, or you can stack them one on top of the other and put the blue band gap, the green band gap, and the red band gap in that sequence so that the high energy photons are absorbed there, the middle ones here, and the low energy photons down there. If you do that, it's possible to think about solar cells that have 60% efficiency. Okay. And where do we stand? Well, let me... Ah. All right. How did that happen? I lost a, I lost a view right here. So these multi-junction solar cells now have been generated that create efficiencies of 40%. Unfortunately, they're very expensive to make because you've got to put, um, you have to fabricate one cell on top of the other in high quality single crystal material. So the applications in which they're used are ones either that are not very cost sensitive and so most of the satellites that circle the Earth today uh, for weather satellites, for surveillance, for communications use these multi-junction solar cells because they're very efficient. Okay? If you want to use them on Earth where you need to cover large areas or you need to use many, many solar cells to generate the kind of electrical power that you need, then what you have to do is create, take one solar cell and then use optics, big lenses, to focus light from a large area onto a small solar cell so that you can multiply the effect of that solar cell by capturing more light in a very small area of cells. In that way, you more efficiently use the solar cell materials. So people are looking at these for concentrator solar cell applications. Now, at USC, we're, we're working on some ideas that we think will allow us to make these kind of multi-junction cells in a thin film structure that will be low cost. And uh, at least that's our hope, and that's what we've been recently funded to do. Okay, so um, I, I just need to tell you that we're right in the Sun Belt in LA, and we're an ideal place uh, all over the Southwest is where the maximum solar uh, insulation occurs. And it's already beginning to happen. This is my house. It's my garage here. Um, I have solar cells in my house. And I generate most of my electrical power through the use of solar energy. Now, you know the sun only shines during the day. And so I'm here during the day, and I'm not at home. So how do I benefit from this? Well, when, during the day when the sun is shining on this, the power from these solar cells just goes back into the electrical grid. It runs my meter backwards, so I get credit for all of the uh, solar energy I generate. And then when I come home and I turn on the air conditioner and the TV and sit like a couch potato, I take back that energy, and the meter runs forward. Okay. So it's like having a storage system by letting other people use my energy when I'm, not, when I'm generating. Okay. Uh, if you didn't do that, then you'd have to have batteries or some, some way of storing the energy to be able to use it when the sun's not shining. And that's one of the, the disadvantages of solar energy. So uh, in, in actual implementation, um, uh, 
the power companies worry about having too much power generated by solar energy because they don't know how to store it. You know, when they generate it, they got to use it, and um, storage is very expensive. So another area of research is in batteries, and there are people here at USC working on batteries. But you know, this is a, a big deal. Uh, Edison, the local power company, uh, just signed a contract with a company to put 600,000 square foot uh, of solar cells on the tops of industrial buildings, these flat buildings that we see very much in LA. They're going to cover those with solar cells and generate energy during the day, use it to uh, satisfy the peak demands that occur during the day, because that's when people are working, that's when air conditioning is on, and the, um, and the solar energy will help uh, reduce that. Okay, so that is the end of my solar energy talk. I gotta show you some cool LEDs. And I was hoping to talk to you about LEDs, but I've already bored you for too long, so I, I won't go through my little presentation. Let me just say that an LED is like a solar cell, except that it's reverse. You put current into the device. Electrons flow into the material, and they, it turns out that by the way that you make the, the junction, that is an LED, uh, the diode, the electrons come in and they're in the higher energy states. So when they encounter an empty state, they can fall down and generate a photon. They generate a photon very close to the energy gap of the material. So in order to make visible light, we have to have materials that have a band gap that are appropriate for visible light. But it's now to the point where these, these devices are almost 100% efficient in generating photons internally, very close to Take, you don't, not all the photons get out because the material will reflect them back in and they get reabsorbed. But a, enough of them get out that we now have uh, devices that are more efficient than any other man-made source of, uh, of light. And so the challenge is to make them co low cost enough that you know, we can put them, all put them in our house. So, for example, I was on the internet recently to try to find a light fixture that would go into one of these recessed lights. If I go to the store, I can buy an incandescent bulb that costs three or four bucks. LED-based one of uh, comparable light output is about 40 bucks. Okay. On the other hand, it's not going to burn out. It's a solid state material it's not going to burn out. And so you have to convince people that there is a cost of ownership by argument, you know, that you won't have to get up on a ladder and extract that thing and convince them that over time they'll save enough energy that it will pay for itself. And that's sometimes hard to do when you're facing a factor of 10 increase in the cost. But that's all the problem you and, and incidentally, we're working on these LEDs now as a means of energy efficiency okay, to create uh, a better, uh, better sources of light. So this, it turns out, is from a commercial company called LumiLeds. It used to be part of Hewlett Packard many years ago. Uh, it's now a separate company and it's owned, uh, I think, by Philips. Phillips makes light bulbs. So what I've got here is a display. Uh, there's a battery in here. And then there are um, eight LEDs here of different energy gaps, and therefore they emit different colors of light. Okay. And I'm going to, you know, you can come up and have a look at this and push the buttons yourself. But um, in the interest of time, I'm going to push the buttons for you. So, Starting over here, we have the smallest energy gap materials, which are emit red light. Okay. So, so bright, 
if you look directly at it, it hurts your eyes. And that's because they're so efficient. Right, so that's a red one. Then I have a material that is um, a little bit more orange. Okay. And that's kind of the color that's in stoplights. Then I have one that's kind of amber. Green. Kind of a, a very pretty green. This is a bluer green. This is what's used in green stoplights. Then, blue, a deeper blue. Huh? Um, yeah. Uh, trust me. It, it's a little. Okay. And this one is a white. saying that LEDs work by electrons and holes following, you know, recombining with one another across the band gap. How do I get white light out of, uh, out of the material? Because that has many different colors in principle. But, well, these things actually just fold your eye. They have a blue LED that uh, excites a material, a phosphor, that and it's kind of yellow light. And the combination of these two colors stimulates the receptors in your eye in such a way that it appears to be white light. Now, if I were to use this and shine it on some surface of different colors, I might see a different color than I would get if I shine white light from a source that had all possible colors. Because the light that we see when we shine some light on a, on a surface is the light that gets reflected. And it depends on how the material reflects different colors of light, what you actually perceive. Okay, so let me show you that one. See, you I don't know if you sense that that's kind of a bluish white. Okay, so by using different phosphors, you can change that color and uh, create a more yellow See, And that looks more like an incandescent bulb, you know, it has a warmer feel. And so uh, people are working on, you know, using different phosphors to create different uh, apparent colors in your eye sense. I hope we, you know, I just talked too much, but I was hoping we could get into you know, how the eye senses the different colors, because it's kind of fascinating. But um, nonetheless, um, you know, there's a whole area of research here that's really, um, really at the forefront of uh, trying to revolutionize how we light things. You know, I live in an area of very close to a hospital, and there are like 10 parking garages near that hospital. Those darn lights are on all night long. Every time I ride by these things, I think, why don't they have LEDs to save, save uh, efficiency? Or maybe have a sensor that turns on the light when you're there. Because you can't do that with a lot of the high efficiency light that is used to light physical structures. Because they take too long to warm up. So if you have LEDs which turn on this. So I think we're heading into a, a period of time when uh, many things in our life are going to be revolutionized by solid state science. Solar cells and solar energy and uh, solid state light. And uh, we're trying to be at the forefront of that here as you can see in our in our research. And I should mention that I uh, I teach a couple of courses at the under, one at the undergraduate, one at the graduate level, where we go into this stuff in great detail, we go into the design and material science of it. 
So it's, uh, I'm, I'm sort of invested very heavily in it, not only because I've got solar cells in my house, but I believe in this stuff. Um, anyway, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have, or you probably, I'm separating you and uh, a period of uh, relaxation, so you probably don't want to. Through the annihilation, you mean of the electron in the hole? Pardon? Well, positron electron reaction is very high energy. It's like uh, 51 mega electron volts, whereas these photons carry an energy of 2 electrons. <laughs> So it's a high energy particle in the reactor. And, you know, there aren't very many positrons around, or else, you know, we'd be in a, in a state here. Thanks, guys. Um, I wanted to go into solar cell and um, um, that kind of work. Major would I have to do? Many different uh, possibilities. Uh, material science. Uh, some of the processes that we use to make these structures are very, uh, very much benefited by people who have knowledge in chemical engineering, okay. material science, uh, electrical engineering, uh, physics. So there's a there's a wide range of possibilities. Study in college, yes. Um, how soon do you think people like on a really large scale, like in a place what they do, to their house, like what you live in your house? It's hard to predict, you know. Um, it, the prices, one of the things that the president is trying to do is to create sort of an artificial market by, by subsidizing. So my solar cells, um, I got 30% back in terms of the cost. So that made it affordable for me. It's still a little bit too expensive compared to regular electrical power, but I wanted to do it because I wanted to do it. You know. um, so you, we need to get the cost of these things down by another factor of two. And then there would be no reason why people wouldn't think about doing it. Um, and that's, it, that's really in the, in the offing right now. There are people who are making uh, large area thin film solar cells. They're not, they're not as efficient as the ones that I have in my garage. But they're improving the efficiency all the time. But the cost of them is way, way down. And so um, uh, there's some environmental issues to be considered because the materials that they're made out of are they have some long-term uh, problems in terms of you know, what do you do when, they're, when you want to replace them? Or, you know, how do you get rid of them? Because you know, they continue to have these issues. But, um, you know, it's happening, and, and I'm, I'm going to think that in a decade, the price of these things is going to be down to the point where they're competitive. You know, um, people who have a longer, heavy uh, ability to think longer term, so a company that is um, you know, worrying about their energy future for the next decade, probably is going to think about investing at least a portion of their energy solar right now, just at the cost. Um, and uh, that will become more and more compelling uh, in, in the next decade, right? How? Oh. Yeah. Um, you did mention the storage of uh, solar cells was difficult. Um, storage of the energy. Stor cells. Yeah, storage of the energy was difficult. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a problem that's come up in the other talks. Yeah. I wanted to know if there's any like for that to try to, other than the batteries. So I mean, is, is the whole battery um, concept, is that something that could actually be done, like, 
like soon, or is it, or are we still kind of far from that? Um, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a real expert in batteries, so I, mm -hmm. I don't know how to project. No. Uh, but I have to believe that the trend towards electric transportation is going to spur innovations in batteries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I don't know for sure. I mean, there are other other ways that you could store the energy. In fact, you know, electric power companies do things like pump water on the top of a hill, and then they let it flow down at night and turn generators. So, of course, you can't do that at your house unless you happen to have your own hill. But, uh, you know, um, there are other ways of storing energy. And there's a lot of research going on. Uh, batteries appear right now to be the most practical. Uh, and uh, they're a little pricey. You know, see, see, when you add that storage part, then you're, you've got the cost of the solar cells themselves plus the storage. You know, that sort of makes it less practical. As, as long as we can continue, as long as the solar energy usage is low enough that we can continue to use it as uh, by pumping it back into the grid for other people who aren't using solar energy at the time to use. Um, that's a real practical way of doing it. But the power companies uh, you know, have a worry that if too much of the energy is generated by solar energy, they view that as an intermittent source of energy because it's not always on. And they have a hard time adjusting their overall power distribution network with those kind of sources. Right now, so few people are doing it, it's no problem. I don't know when that becomes an issue. Hopefully batteries will be ready. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, like when Well, it just goes it just goes into the power grid. Okay? So it's like hooking up a battery to the power grid, and people will draw on that. And so that energy just gets spread over the city of LA or the whole distribution. So it's not any one specific person, but it's being used by someone, and um, and so we're not wasting. The yeah, it has to, because I have no local way of storing the energy, so I just pump it into the grid for someone else to use. And I get, turns out I get uh, credit for it at the rate that they charge me for power. There's no wholesale. Anymore. So I, it's a good deal for me. It runs my meter backwards. And um, so we, we, we can have a good long time before there's so much solar energy generated that that's a problem. You know, I don't mean to say that that's the only way that you can use solar cells is distributed at people's houses. I mean, the power companies are building large power plants uh, out in the desert and other places um, that use solar energy to create electricity. And they use it as a way of reducing the need to have extra power plants you know, coal-fired power plants during the day when the power usage is the highest. And they have a big problem because their power usage, you know, peaks up in the middle of the day and falls at night. And they've got to have enough capacity to generate the power at the peak. Right? So if they can use solar energy to reduce how many other power plants they need to have online. That's good.
in, in one solar star, by like having more photons hit the solar star. And the, the actual efficiency of the device goes up. But it's not factors of two or anything. So, the amount of power you get out divided by the amount of total power that's focused on it uh, is the efficiency, and it goes up like 5% or something, relative. Um, but you save on the cost of the solar system, because you're using you know, 1 over the concentration times the area that you would have to do to cover the solar system. So that's particularly important for expensive stuff. To do that. And one of the things that I'm working on my group is trying to come up with a concentrator idea that we could use on people's houses. Because if you have a big lens that's focusing on to a solar cell, you've got to have a lot of them for one thing. You've got to cover an area of equivalent to my solar panel. Then they become very tall and very kind of ugly. So we're trying to come up with Very low. It's, uh, I, I, I asked a couple of people who should know, and it's less than a percent. But it's easy, and it's free, almost. So, you have that, you know. And it also takes carbon dioxide out of it. It does a lot of good things. <laughs> you know, I, th I thought a little bit about it. No, I'm not. I'm not too afraid. They're, you know, they're pretty well anchored down. And, uh, you know, I guess if I were away on vacation, it's possible something would happen. But, you know, the amount of work that you'd have to go through and the amount of money, actually, that you could return from it, I don't think it's worth it. It's all about like going and cutting a copper pipe out somewhere running down the sun to the local junk field, you know, which is mm -hmm. happening all the time these days. But, uh, so I'm not too worried about it, but it, the thought has crossed my mind from time to time. I haven't done anything to, I'm not going to tell you where I'm living. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done anything to secure them other than, you know, the normal anchoring that's done. Can I get this name? <laughs> <laughs> There's some things that you can do, uh, you know, by yourself in a, in a very small, just to play around with these ideas. I mean, one thing you go to a radio shack and buy a solar cell for a few bucks, but uh, you want to get deeper into what's happening. This is um, a book that I just I just found, Solar Energy Projects for the Evil Genius, and it's endorsed by Willie Nelson, so you know it's got to be. Anyway, I, I bought it primarily because I got some grandkids and I thought I would mess around and build some, some stuff with them. But it's got some nice projects. I don't know. You know, you're probably all plugged into your iPods and don't have time to it. If, if you unplug it. Right? Okay? Thanks for your attention. Thank you.